Hello, uh, this is a course on fundamentals of micro and nano fabrication. My name is Sushobha Namasi. I am from Indian Institute of Science and let us get started. So, this lecture is on cleaning of substrates. In the last lecture, we looked at what are the various substrates that we have on offer and what are the various properties they have. Uh, in, our, in this lecture, we will try to go one step further and start seeing how to do actual fabrication on it and most fabrication starts with a cleaning step. So, that is the subject of this lecture. Uh, this is the agenda. We will start with some description of what a commercial foundry or fab as it is called looks like. Uh, that has a bearing on why uh, we need so much cleaning. So, only when you understand how the fab is structured can you really appreciate to what level semiconductor, uh, semiconductor industry has gone to ensure cleanliness and uh, purity. That will lead into the importance of the clean room. Uh, we look at specifically two types of contamination, particulate contamination, chemical contamination and finally, we will discuss ITRS requirement. ITRS is a industry body which gives out the roadmap for where the industry would be in the future, say 5 to 10 years in the future. And uh, looking at the ITRS requirement, you can start to appreciate how stringent the cleanliness requirements are. Uh, finally, we will talk about the specifics uh, that is the recipes that we use to actually do the cleaning. We we'll look at some wet recipes, we we'll look at some dry recipes and some back of the uh, back of the process uh, cleaning. Finally, we we'll look at some characterizations uh, though I will touch on it very briefly because the uh, major thrust of this lecture and this course is on the actual uh, fabrication. So, let us start with an example. Uh, this is a fab that was jointly made by Intel and Micron uh, which are two very large semiconductor uh, industries and they set up a joint facility in Utah sometimes in 2011 and it was a 25 nanometer node. Uh, the rest of the details do not matter, but I want you to concentrate on this figure that they released of what the architecture of their clean room looks like. So, a few things to note. Uh, first thing, this is the main clean room. This is where most of the equipment are stored. This is where the wafers are being processed. This is where the humans are interacting with the wafers. So, this is the business end, but behind this business end is a much larger substructure of utilities that help make this clean room work. So, let us take it one step at a time. So, first let us look at the pressurized plena. So, the clean room remains clean by pushing pressurized air through it. Uh, that pressurized air is pushed from this plenum. Uh, and in order to make sure the air goes from top to bottom, the pleaner tends to be at higher pressure than atmosphere. This high pressure is maintained by what are called uh, MAH or uh, air handling units. So, these air handling units are essentially very high capacity fans that push air and that air is then pushed down into the clean room. The blue things that you see on the top are what are called HEPA filters. These are very high quality, very high fidelity filters uh, that actually clean this air into the standard that is required for the clean room. I will uh, talk about specifics a little later. All of this air that has been purified is very expensive. So, it is not thrown away. Uh, it is sucked out by these holes in the floor uh, into this clean subfab. This is also a, a clean area. This air is then taken back through the MAH and again pushed back. And this air circulation is done several times a minute. For example, the clean room at IISC, this air circulation is done four times a minute. This continuous circulation is a important for purity, but also important for safety. Uh, end of the day in a confined space, people need oxygen and that oxygen is to be continuously supplied. Uh, so, the, the, the circulation also ensures that you never have accumulation of carbon dioxide, etcetera. Uh, those of you who are probably paying attention may notice that in a closed loop system, ultimately the oxygen will deplete. So, we cannot have that. So, what MAH also does it bleeds in fresh air every now and then at a certain rate, so that this air is never old or stale. Some part of this air is lost through uh, hoods and other equipment. We will talk about that in a minute. Uh, so, 
the, the, the whole system is designed in a manner that the input air that you are sucking in from outside and the air that you are losing from the clean room are balanced and a certain pressure is always maintained inside this clean room. Finally, there is a utility level. A lot of this, what I just talked about, requires large machinery, air handling units, uh, air conditioners, purifiers, etc. And also, the clean room itself has a lot of equipment uh, that requires, uh, say, pumps, uh, wa cooling water, chilled water, uh, compressed air, etc. All of those utilities are then supplied from the bottom. Uh, this whole design uh, also serves a functional purpose in that the clean room is a very expensive and a very productive space. So every time something goes down, you don't want to shut down the clean room. So what actually you do is you just take whatever is default, the defective equipment into the clean subfab, do whatever maintenance repair you want to do, and then it push back up. All of this um, air handling and all of this architecture comes at a significant cost. So the typical cost of a modern fab is in the order of 10 billion. It can be a few billion above, a few billion below, which translates to around 63, 64. I, th I think at the current uh, at the current uh, rate around 70,000 crore rupees. So that's a significant investment. And what I want you to appreciate is why are we willing to make such a significant investment for something that we use in our uh, that we use. You know, as a matter of course, like when you, you buy a cell phone, it's relatively cheap. You don't really appreciate that behind that cell phone and behind that chip that is cheap is a significant infrastructure investment. So now let's come to the concept, which brings me to the concept of clean room. Uh, so the way a clean room is maintained clean is by pushing compressed air. So here is an example of what we just saw, just a blown up version. So you see that you have air handler units and those air handler units are pushing air through these filters into the room and then the room has perforated floor so that air is again sucked out and again circulated back in. Uh, any dust that is created either by an uh, individual inside the clean room or by the equipment is actually pushed down by this flow of air. Uh, so this air, the more laminar this airflow is, the better the quality of a clean room is. So on the left is an example of a cheap clean room where the airflow is not necessarily laminar uh, and typically research fabs or uh, low cost university fabs tend to be of this design but high quality fabs always have a laminar flow and look closer to what is on the right. So this is what a typical uh, fab, uh, in, in fact these are pictures exactly from the same uh, Intel Micron joint facility that we were talking about. And I want to highlight some of the um, salient features. Uh, one thing you notice is that there are very few people inside and that is by design as we will discuss. Clean rooms are, the biggest contaminant in a clean room is the human inside. So by reducing the number of humans inside you can uh, get a control on the contamination inside. The second thing you would notice is all the humans are within what we call bunny suits. Uh, these bunny suits actually prevent uh, particles that you continuously generate from shedding out. Uh, on top you see these rails. Uh, these rails are actually robots which manage the wafers. Uh, humans, uh, in modern fabs, humans do not come into contact with wafers at all because humans create a lot of contamination. So it's always these uh, wafer, uh, wafers are always handled by these robots which are called Automatic Material Handling System or AMHS. On the left hand side, these, this bank of uh, tools are what actually are doing the processing. So each of them is probably for a different process. Uh, and uh, you also notice this perforated floor, uh, which maintains the laminar uh, flow of air that may, keeps the clean room clean. You might also have noticed next to each tool was this orange colored box. These boxes are what store the wafers. So wafers are typically processed in batches of 25 or 50. And each of these boxes stores the wafer. Once again, the boxes are completely sealed. So despite this being a clean room, the wafer never sees this clean room. The wafer always sees a much purer environment of inside this pod. And all uh, removal and addition of the wafers into the pod and outside the pod is all managed by robots. So these are called FOOPs or front opening unified pod. The third picture I'd like to show you is again of the same clean room, but this time you see that there's a yellow light. Uh, this yellow light is because when you're doing lithography, uh, you have light sensitive chemicals that you do not want exposed. Uh, this is some version of a dark room. Uh, in the old times, um, when people 
were taking photography films and developing photography films, they used to have dark rooms where they would develop those. Uh, lithography is a very similar technology, so it uses similar sort of quote unquote yellow rooms that uh, prevent exposure and allow processing to happen. Once again, you see these tools, these are lithography tools. You again see the hermetic pods where the wafers are stored and you see the AHMS, AMHS, which are the robots that do the handling of wafers. So why do we do so much to prevent uh, cleanliness or contamination inside the clean room? Like why do we spend so much money? You saw that it's a very highly engineered infrastructure. Why is cleanliness so important? And the reason for that is that particulate and chemical contamination, which are the two broad uh, classes of contamination that we can suffer from, are very, very uh, bad for the device. So particulate contamination can kill your yield, which uh, is uh, the number of working devices. Uh, it, can allow, it can prevent uh, your process to, from being repeatable. So day-to-day -day variation into process is extremely hard to track and allow, does not allow you to do reliable manufacturing. Because remember, each chip has billions of transistors and if unless all the transistors perform exactly the same, you are not going to make a reliable device, a reliable chip. Chemical contamination uh, causes a whole bunch of reliability problems. A chemical might move inside the device over time, which would mean the performance of the device would shift over time. So the, the computer chip that works today may not work five years from today and all of those are humongous problems. And a lot of um, clean rooms uh, are shared facilities, uh, which means that multiple industries or multiple users or multiple research groups actually work inside. So contamination is not, it's something that is bad also from a social perspective, uh, which is that it does not just adversely affect your device or your performance or your work, but contaminating a clean room makes also ensures that everybody else who works in that shared space would also feel the contamination. So you don't just make your device worse, you make everybody's devices worse. And uh, finding the source of a contamination once it has already happened is notoriously difficult, almost impossible. The best way forward is to prevent the contamination from happening in the first place by establishing norms, protocols, and keeping the clean room clean. So let's first talk about particulate contamination. The problem is fairly simple. Uh, if you look at a microscopic scale, uh, this air, even though it seems transparent and clean, actually has a lot of particles. And these particles can then fall on top of your dye that you are trying to process or on top of your wafer that you are trying to process. And if you are doing micro and nano fabrication, it doesn't take too much to understand that any particle that falls that is of micro or nanometer scale will ultimately change your device. Right? So th that's very simple. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that these small particles are notoriously hard to remove. Uh, here's a calculation that tries to explain why. So any particle adheres to the surface through, van, through some version of a van der Waals or surface uh, tension. Uh, and if you actually measure that adhesion force, for its size, that adhesion force is fairly strong. So here's an example. Here's a table. So supposing you were taking silicon dioxide beads, which is glass beads <coughs> of small size, and look at their relative adhesion force. So of course, smaller particles will have smaller force, but that is not uh, an apples to apples comparison. A better comparison would be how much stronger the adhesive force is compared to gravity, right? So if the weight of a particle is x, how much, what multiple of x is the adhesive force? So for a 100 micron uh, bead, the adhesive force is 510 times stronger. While for a 100 nanometer bead, the adhesive force is 7.5 million times stronger. What that means is particles don't fall down. If you take a die and just turn it upside down, the particle will not fall because of gravity. The adhesive force is way stronger than gravity. Even mechanical action like scrubbing or blowing may not be enough to dislodge the particle. So once a particle falls, it's very, very hard to remove it, uh, especially with mechanical means. And that is why it's so hard to keep uh, it's so important to keep the wafer clean in the first place by just preventing that particle from being inside the clean room in the first place. Of course, in reality, particles are always there of various sizes. Once particles do form, for example, here is a particle that has fallen between two electrodes. Uh, they can change properties, they can lead to pinholes, they can lead to shorts, they can lead to open circuits, all of which reduces manufacturing heat 
And since the fab is so expensive, the capital investment is so large, any loss of time is a loss of money. So you never want your fab to do wasteful work. The fab should be productive all the time. So yield really needs to be high. Yield typically, the typical yield numbers are 99.9 percent something. What are the various sources of contamination? Uh, there are as many sources as you can probably imagine. Here is an example for various types of uh, particles that we can get in uh, ambient air. And depending upon what their source is, the size of the particle changes. Clearly, the smaller the particle, the harder it is to remove it, as we have discussed. But also, the smaller the particle, the more it affects your device performance. So, as we are trying to make nano-sized devices, we are more and more sensitive to nano-sized particles. Um, common example is, for example, pollen, uh, smoke, uh, carbon, uh, both from, uh, from, from burning and as well as from naturally that occurs. There is atmospheric dust, there is viruses, there is bacteria. Uh, and all of these things can fall on top of your wafer. An additional uh, thing is that when you process your wafer, when you are doing chemical, uh, chemical processing on it or if you are doing some mechanical processing on it, just the fact that you are using or touching the wafer would also produce particles. So those particles also need to be removed. Uh, the particulate contamination problem is a little tricky to model or to mathematically look at partly because the fact that a particle has fallen does not automatically mean that it will cause a problem. It depends on where it has fallen. So there is a certain amount of probability involved in this. For example, the particle may have fallen between two metal lines in which case it is not affecting anything. But if the same particle falls maybe partially onto the line, it might increase the resistance. But if it falls between two lines, it might cause a shot which might completely kill the device. So there is a certain probability associated with the defect doing something really bad. A lot of this leads to a, a fairly complicated math. I will not go into the details, but I will give you a flavor of what a typical uh, uh, yield calculation would look like. So here is uh, one example. Uh, this is a busy slide. I will uh, walk you through it. Let us first start on the left. So for a given wafer size, uh, process yield is simply the number of devices that work or number of dyes that work. So typically in microfabrication, you start with a wafer, you simultaneously process several dyes uh, next to each other and then you cut it up and each die is a, is a functional uh, chip that you can sell. right? So the yield of your process exponentially depends upon the, the defect density. So the more the defect density, the lower the yield. So there is a negative exponent here. The higher the probability of causing failure, the lower the yield. And the second thing it depends upon is what is the number of dyes per unit area. Now this may not be intuitively obvious. A better way to understand this is if you look at n is nothing but 1 over a, where a is the size of the average die. So all of this is best uh, uh, discussed as an example. So let us now look at the three figures. Let us start here, these two figures. So here you have two wafers that are roughly of the same size, right? And uh, these in this wafer, each this is a functional tie. So what you are going to do is you are going to cut this uh, wafer up into uh, small pieces, and 16 you will get 16 dies, each of which is a working IC that you can sell. Right? Now supposing this was the same process was done in two different clean rooms. One was very well controlled, so the number of defects were low. So you only have these blue dots represent defects that were formed because of particles. So there were fewer defects in clean room one, there were more defects in clean room two. If you just look at it and if you assume that each defect would kill the device, uh, you can easily see that out of the total 16 possible working device, on the left you would get 12 working devices, which is a 75 percent yield, and on the right you would get only 8 working devices, which is a 50 percent yield. So this is definitely a less productive clean room than clean room 1. Uh, and now this formula probably makes sense to you uh, uh, as far as p into d is concerned. Now in order to understand what this n does, now let us look at the third figure. So in this case, what I have done is I have kept the wafer the same size. However, I have changed the size of the die. So now instead of getting 16 dies from one wafer, you are supposing only getting 4. So the, your die size is a little larger, which is that your A is a little larger. And to keep things simple, I have kept the number of defects exactly the same on the left and on the right. 
So in these two cases, when you compare, you can just again do the math. You will see that none of the dyes are actually defect free. So your yield is zero. Right? So by simply changing the area of the dye, you have actually reduced your yield. And if you think about it, that intuitively makes sense that if you have a possibility of a defect occurring, the smaller the die size, the more chance you have of missing that defect. But if your die sizes are large, then you don't have any hope of missing that defect and you would always uh, end up with a lower yield. So that's the intuition behind this n number. In general, uh, larger dies lead to your lower yield. Uh, higher defect densities tend to lower yield and higher probability of causing a defect would also lower the yield. So these are three things that you have to maintain in a process. The easiest of them to do is, uh, and what is the subject of this lecture, is to reduce D, right? To keep the defects or the particles falling onto the wafer to a minimum. So how do you actually reduce this particle contamination? Well, we have discussed it before. You do it in a clean room uh, where you have uh, a continuous flow of air. There are certain standards of what a cleanliness of a clean room is. Uh, they are called ISO or the FED standards. On the right, you can actually see uh, I don't expect you to remember these numbers. This is just to give you an example. For example, uh, this is a class 1000 clean room at ISC. And if you notice what class 1000 means, so this is what class 1000 is. Class 1000 tells you that you should not have more than 293 particles that are larger than 5 micron inside a cubic meter. And then it gives specifications for what is, what about the particles of 1 micron, 0.5 microns, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, a few things to notice, as the particle size becomes lower, you tend to, you have to tolerate more and more particles and that is because it becomes increasingly harder to clean, right. The other thing I would like you to notice is going from a class 100 to a class 1000 is an order of magnitude change, right. So going from a class 100 to a class 1 is two orders of magnitude change. So it becomes increasingly hard and expensive to clean. Uh, so a commercial fab often uh, inside the, uh, the environment that the wafer sees is sometimes class 1 or even better. It can be say ISO 1. Uh, and those are very stringent requirements and very, very expensive to maintain. So this is why clean rooms are expensive to make. This is why clean rooms are expensive to operate. The greatest contamination inside the clean room is the human himself. You are a polluting person <laughs> in the sense that every minute you spend inside the clean room, you are creating particles. Uh, you are shedding hair, you are shedding skin, uh, just by virtue of you talking, you a little a small droplets of saliva are coming out from your mouth. So everything you do inside the clean room creates particles. And the amount of particles you create actually scales with the amount of intensity of the activity you are doing. So if you are just standing, you are maybe uh, uh, creating around 10 power 5 particles, but if you start exercising, you are creating two orders of magnitude more number of particles. What this means is inside the clean room, be very disciplined. Walk slowly, move slowly, move deliberately. You are not supposed to be jerky, uh, hasty, or uh, yeah. Clean room is there. You are only supposed to work in the clean room when it's work time. You do your work, you get out, you don't loiter around because Every person inside the clean room is a load that the clean room has to manage. Um, this is also sort of given an, in this uh, data that we actually have from our ISC clean room, where each clean room is designed for a certain number of people inside. So we expect a certain amount of particles to be created and we design the, clean, uh, the airflow in the clean room to remove those particles at a certain rate. So for example, this is a room uh, which has been designed for two people working simultaneously. But if suddenly instead of two, you have uh, six or 21 people inside, say because of a training, then suddenly the clean room can't cope up anymore and the particle count goes up. So if somebody is doing something uh, critical while there are 21 people inside the clean room, they may not get the yield that they need. So it's very important to uh, keep the discipline of the clean room. One way we reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the contamination that the human causes inside the clean room is to put you inside bunny suits. Um, so a bunny suit typically is a certain gown uh, made from polyester or some fabric that does not create particle on its own. So it can't be cotton. It can't be a lab coat. Um, then you always have gloves. Again, nitride gloves. You can't have uh, cotton or some other uh, lint. Uh, lint full uh, fabric. It has to be a lint free fabric. Often masks are required, 
glasses are required both for safety but also from uh, for particle contamination and hair net if you have a beard you might also need an addition beer hold uh, this is true e for across genders even women are expected to completely tie up their hair so that no hair ever comes out into clean room and then you have some shoe covers uh, or booties so that any dust from your shoes or from your uh, feet does not come out so this is what you typically look like inside a clean room uh, a few common mistakes please no visible wrists you always have to ensure that your glove and the hem of your uh, clean room gown are, comp are one on top of each other so there is no exposed skin in the middle uh, you are not supposed to sneeze wander or dance you are also not supposed to touch any dirty surface which includes your face so please don't wipe your face and work inside the clean room because that dirty is of the glove which will ultimately dirty up the clean room once again be disciplined the second thing that you have to be careful inside a clean room is chemical contamination uh, the sources of chemical contamination are obvious uh, just that we live in an environment where that can be atmospheric contamination there can be soot carbon soot there can be uh, exhaust from a car that might weigh, might make its way inside the clean room but also from you uh, our skins have uh, secrete oils our skin secretes sweat and all of that can be a contamination then we also use a lot of chemicals inside the clean room which themselves can be sources of contamination they might be contaminate contaminants inside the chemicals that we are using and that might also be a source of contamination so all of these things have to be managed that all the tools that we are using uh, not all of them are made of plastic some of them are made of steel so now that steel can cause iron contamination and iron is a very very bad contaminant contaminant in silicon at least so the sources of contamination are way more uh, are several and so even if inside a clean room if you are doing everything right you have to actively do things to reduce contamination that is coming uh, coming in all the time here's an example of uh, what contam chemical contamination can do uh, this is a device this is a mosfet uh, mos uh, transistor if you don't know much about it uh, maybe i can give you a very short primer the way the mos transistor works is that there is a sheet of electrons here at the interface of a device and that sheet of electrons is modulated that is turned on or off by a gate on the top so it's a capacitive coupling now in a capacitor uh, the electric field is what actually uh, creates this channel right now supposing you have some mobile ion say supposing you have some sweat contamination from sweat so sweat is sodium chloride which means you have positive sodium ions and that positive sodium ions remain in this dielectric now what can that do well what that does is that when you apply this bias you don't just all the 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 voltage is not just applied onto the electrons which is what you need but also these positive charges and these positive charges will sort of move up and down in your device and over a time it will it will shift the iv characteristics of your device and this character shift is not it cannot be planned for because this shift will come and go depending upon how long did you apply the bias so it's a transient effect right so these things are not very very hard to design for and uh, circuit designers hate it so you have to avoid the sodium contamination in the first place because once it has happened the device is gone and it doesn't take much to cause the shift uh, again, I don't hope uh, for you to remember the formula. We will not quiz you on it. I just wanted to give the formula so that we can be a little quantitative. So if you actually do a calculation that what will it take to shift this IV characteristic by 100 millivolt, which is by in the scheme of things is a relatively small number. And if you do the calculation, you will see that it only takes around 10 to the power 15 atoms per centimeter square to cause the change. Now, this seems like a large number, but it isn't uh, because sorry it only requires 10 to the power 11 ions to make a change and this is not a large number because what you can compare it it can compare it with the atomic density of silicon so silicon has around 10 to the power 15 atoms per centimeter square so if you just have 10 to the power 11 which is 1 in 10,000 contamination you will have a IV shift of 100 millivolts so in order to reduce it further your contamination level needs to be better than 1 in 10,000 and that's a pretty high bar another example of what contamination can do uh, this is uh, an sram so in ram what actually happens is you store charges and those charges um, are, are stored as a capacitor and long story short without going into the de uh, details typically you need bulk defect density 
uh, of less than 10 to the power 12 centimeter cube. So, this is not surface but bulk defect density. And once again, if you compare this with the silicon atomic density, which is 10 to the power 22, you realize that the bulk contamination needs to be less than 0.1 ppb, right? So, it is a remarkably low number. So, very little amount of contamination either in the surface or in the bulk will cause significant change in the performance of the device and must, must not be allowed to happen, okay? So, how do we do that? Well, to start off, we use the purest form of water we can find. So, this is called deionized water. Uh, this is purer than what you would call distilled water in the sense that it is completely stripped of all impurities and ions uh, to the point where it becomes insulating. Most people think of water as conducting, which it is in most cases, but here we have purified water to a point where it becomes insulating. Uh, the way we do that is we, uh, there is a multi-stage process. It is a very expensive process to make. You start with particle filtration, water softer, activated carbon till here is a typical kitchen water filter. But then after that, we then do reverse osmosis, we do ion removal by electrodeionization, and we also have a resin based polishing stage. And DI water never remains clean because the air has carbon dioxide and then carbon dioxide will dissolve in that water and make it uh, and the uh, carbon will form carbonate which is an ion. So, just by standing in air, deionized water becomes ionized again. So, in order to keep DI water DI, you have to continuously circulate it. So, the water never remains still, it is continuously circulated in a polishing loop so that when you are actually using it, it is of the highest purity. In general, only use DI water for all processing. Uh, even if the paper does not specify it, if it says use water, it means use DI water. Virtually in the no circumstances inside the clean room should you ever use any other form of water. Uh, by the way, uh, you may have noticed that uh, I told, uh, you, may, uh, you may notice that I said key water becomes insulating and in fact, it becomes 18 mega ohm centimeter. Where that number comes from? That number simply comes from um, thermodynamics or kinetics. Uh, so, pure water has an H plus and OH minus concentration of around 16 to the power 13. Uh, the conductivity is simply given by uh, Ohm's law, uh, which says uh, that you simply multiply uh, diffusivity by Q by KT, which is mobility and you simply multi this mobility translates to a conductivity and if you calculate the conductivity for this ion concentration, it comes out to be 18.6. So, absolutely pure water, which only has thermodynamically limited H plus and OH minus concentrations tends to be 18.6. Uh, typically, in our clean room, for example, we always maintain this number of around 18.2. The second thing we do to create uh, to uh, reduce chemical contamination is to have ultra pure chemicals. Uh, these are typically called CMOS grade chemicals, uh, VLSI or ULSI grade chemicals. Uh, the, the, the contamination in the, these chem chemicals is extremely low. It is specified by the SEMI standard. This is very stringent sta uh, standard that actually requires more than 30 types of impurities to be less than 10 or 200 ppb. Here is an example, for example. Uh, it also has very stringent requirements of what particle density is allowed in these chemicals. Uh, by far, these are the purest chemicals you can buy on the market. Uh, try to avoid other pure chemical grains uh, that you can uh, get on chemistry websites. For example, HPLC, uh, which is actually a liquid chromatography uh, uh, grade, is still not clean enough. Uh, also avoid uh, ACS pure grades, which is specified by Michael Chemical Society, it is still not as clean as CMOS grade. Uh, you can also buy chemicals which are often called electronic grade. Uh, this is not an industry standard, it could mean anything. As much as possible, avoid all these weird uh, standards, stick to CMOS chemical if you can find it. Here are some examples, um, I would not spend too much more time on it, you can look at it. This is, this is somebody who has done actual measurement of uh, contamination inside a CMOS grade chemical. So, Q, uh, QL is at the resolution of the measurement. So, this is the smallest that the measurement could have measured. Uh, on the right is the specification. This is what the semi standard says and in the middle are the numbers that they actually found. And in most cases, you would see the practically measured numbers are actually significantly lower, an order of magnitude lower than the specifications, okay. So, even though the specifications are very stringent, the industry actually manages to get even better numbers. In general, much, much lower numbers, contaminations in parts per trillion all the time. 
We also use extremely high purity gases, uh, typically 5N or 6N, which is 99.999 or 99.9999 percent. Uh, in modern plants, several of these gases are actually generated on site for maximum purity and control. We also, in very, very specific, in very specialized cases, we also have inline purifiers so that at the point of use, you can further purify the gas. Uh, this purity is extremely critical for processes like CVD, uh, something that we will touch upon when we discuss CVD uh, a couple of lectures later. Finally, there is also some sort of contamination policy. So, this is especially important in common facilities which are used by several groups or several people. And uh, the, the equipment that is used for one purpose can be uh, ca can accumulate a certain type of contamination that is bad for another person. So, in order to keep the output consistent, the purity of the tool has to be maintained. So, you do that by restricting the substrates or the materials that actually go inside. So, uh, this is an example of something that we do at ISC. Some version of this is, exists in virtually every common use facility, where we give levels to each uh, equ equipment and you are only allowed to put a certain type of substrate with a certain type of contamination profile into uh, that tool. So, level 1 tools tend to be the cleanest, level 4 tools tend to be the dirtiest and you are not allowed until unless in some special circumstances to go from level 4 to level 3 or go from level 3 to level 2, you are always asked to go from top to bottom, you are only asked to go from level 1 to level 4. So, you have to map your process in a manner uh, that is consistent with the contamination policy of the clean room. Um, uh, next, uh, I just want to leave you with this slide, uh, which is the ITRS uh, requirement. Uh, I, want, I mentioned ITRS is the industry, uh, it is an industry body that lays down the roadmap of where the industry needs to be several years from today. So, for example, this is where we are in 2015 uh, and the ITRS uh, laid out the numbers that they would like to achieve in 2024 and you can see it always uh, moves towards more stringent requirements. Uh, the, the amount of surface contamination, the amount of uh, critical metal contamination, etc., is in very, very low numbers. Okay. So, in most cases, less than parts per billion. Uh, just uh, one, once again, I have said this a couple of times, but I will say it again. If you want to understand or get an intuition of how, how small this number is, always compare it with the atomic density or the bulk density. So, all the numbers that are per centimeter square should be compared with the silicon surface density, which is 7 into 10 power 14 all the centimeter cube numbers need to be compared with the volume, atomic volume, atomic density of silicon which is 10 power 22. So, you will get a sense of what percentage uh, purity we are talking about. So, with that introduction to fabs, let us now get into how do we keep our wafers clean. Okay? So, the wafers, uh, you need cleaning recipes uh, partly because of this. So, supposing you start with the wafer that is very clean and you are doing it in uh, doing this processing in ultra clean uh, clean room. As you do multiple processes, just the fact that you are interacting with this wafer, you are doing some processing on this wafer, the accumulation on this wafer will build up and this accumulation is significant. This is log scale, right? So, towards the end of your processing step, your, your uh, contamination might be 1000 times more than what you started with on a virgin wafer. The only way we are man we are able to manage this is before critical steps and critical typically means steps that are um, critical as defined uh, by the user. Before critical steps, we do cleaning, uh, uh, trying to reduce this uh, contamination back down to lower levels so that it does not propagate in the whole of the wafer. Typically, critical processes are the one that uh, create the most impact on yield. We always already have discussed what is yield. Uh, Typically, these are high temperature steps. So, before every high temperature step, you want to do a cleaning step. Uh, why high temperatures? This is something you will appreciate more when we discuss diffusion a couple of lectures later. So, with that introduction of what is a fab, uh, why do we need a clean room, what, is, what are the standards when we talk about a clean room, uh, we will end this lecture here. In the next lecture, we will go into more details on how we actually do cleaning. Uh, even though we have a clean room, the wafers will become dirty. So, we must have a way of uh, cleaning that surface. So, see you next time.